Hi everyone, Ms. Song here. Welcome to today's lesson. Today we'll be looking at the final part of the origins of the Cold War. Specifically, we'll be looking at this topic on the manifestations of the Cold War. Okay. What you will need to have with you is this worksheet, worksheet G4. Okay. So similarly, manifestations of the Cold War. And this is a big inquiry question. And there are blanks that you re you realize that there are many blanks for you to fill. So as the lesson goes along, just fill this in. Okay. Now, let's jump into the lesson proper. So this is the final section of the origins of the Cold War. And the big inquiry question now that we're looking at is how did the ideological differences between the USA and the USSR manifest in actual conflict? Okay, so what does this actually mean? These ideological differences refer to a difference in views on how the world should be run. Okay, so the Americans wanted a democratic or capitalist world. The Soviets wanted a communist world. Now, how do these actual differences in ideas eventually lead to people fighting, right? Why would this lead to tangible fighting? So the word tangible means felt. You can actually see, you can actually hear people fighting. Okay, so that's the focus for today's lesson. So the lesson objectives is that firstly, we're going to recap the formation of opposing economic alliances. So you should recall the Truman Doctrine, Comic Con, Comic Inform, and the Marshall Plan. These were the economic alliances that we should have already covered. Um, next, you should be able to describe the events of the Berlin blockade which was an event that took place in 1948-49. It was one of the starting events um, that, that struck off the, the Cold War conflict between the USA and the USSR. It was fought over the future of Germany. Next, we'll be talking about opposing military alliances. So no longer just political or economic alliances, but now they are going to form military alliances against each other. And finally, we want to be able to describe how the Cold War extended beyond Europe to affect countries all around the world. Okay, so these are the four big things. Okay, so table of contents is what we'll be covering. First, I'm going to recap the Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan and how the Soviets or Stalin formed the Common Form and Common Con in response. Next, we'll be looking at this episode called the Berlin Blockade. In the third part of the lesson, we'll look at the military blocks. The ones that the Allies or the Western European powers formed was called NATO. And the ones that the Soviets and the Communists formed was called the Warsaw Pact. And finally, we look at how it extended to become a global conflict. Okay, so let's start off with this idea. Okay on the opposing political and economic bloc. Okay, a bloc here refers to an alliance, uh, a group of countries coming together with a common purpose. So we recall in the previous lessons, in 1947, USA announces the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan. Um, and in response to this, the USSR sets up Common Form and Common Con to counter the Americans. What essentially was happening was that both the Americans and the Soviets wanted to set up their respective spheres of influence. Okay, a sphere of influence refers to the zone where they have a lot of control over. And they attempted to do this through political and economic alliances. So we recall the Truman Doctrine was a political idea that the Americans were going to support countries that were at risk of falling to communism. That's a political idea. Economically, how do we do this? How do we prevent people from falling to communism? It's through the Marshall Plan, where they will supply a lot of money. Um, and in response to this, Common Form and Comic Con were formed. Now, you will note that in this Venn diagram, there's this overlapping space. However, these blocks were mutually exclusive. You could either join the American sphere of influence, that means you could receive Marshall Plan um, and support from the Americans, or you could be part of Common Form and Comic Con. You could not choose to be part of both. You can start to imagine that this is going to pressurize a lot of European powers into thinking, okay, should I align myself or should I join with the Americans or should I join with the Soviets? So, because of these um, economic and political spheres of influence, there is now these competing blocs where both the USA and the Soviet Union are going to compete for to win countries over to their respective sides. And this marked the start of Cold War bipolarity and cause Europe to become divided along political and economic lines. Now, what is the meaning of bipolarity? This does not refer to a mental health condition. Rather, it refers to how the world is going to be split into two. So, bipolarity. Bi is the idea of two. So, what this means is that only two countries in the world possess the greatest economic, cultural, and military influ influence. So, these are the two superpowers of the world. Back then, you could be thinking of um, America and the Soviet Union. In today's context, you might think that, hey, maybe it's not bipolar, maybe it's tripolar. So you think of America, you think of China, you think of the Russians. Okay, 
So bipolarity, the idea of polarity in the other sense means you can think of it like your North Pole and South Pole, they're on opposite ends, they are completely opposite, they're separate. So these two superpowers are going to establish mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means you can join either of the blocks, but not both, and competing um, blocks in uh, Europe. Okay. So that's what bipolarity means. Now, the first major conflict that we we'll start to see is over this idea of the Berlin blockade. This is going to be the first Cold War crisis that took place in the world. Um, and when we study this crisis, what is useful to historians and to, to students of history is that it highlighted the tensions between the USA and the USSR. It started to make it very clear that these guys had different visions or conflicting visions on how the world should be run, specifically over the future of Germany. If you see um, the map on the right side of this picture, you can see that um, this is the map of Germany post-war, and it's being separated into four main colours. We should recall that based on the wartime conferences, there was an agreement to split um, Germany into four occupation zones. So each of these colours represents uh, which country they fall under. So this, the green region represents the region that Britain would take. Blue represents France, yellow represents Americans, and the red represents what the Soviet Union would take over. So essentially, they will agree, okay, we should split Nazi Germany up and ensure that each of these major countries, the four powers, have control over a certain area. Now, so this is what we talked about. Um, so in the Yalta and Potsdam conference, there's an agreement that Germany will be split into four occupation zones, split between France, Britain, USA, and USSR. The tricky part is the capital Berlin, you notice over here, is also going to be divided into four zones. Now, you realize that Berlin is right smack in the middle of the Soviet controlled occupation zone. And this is what Berlin would look like. So Berlin is the, the capital of Germany at a point in time. And even within Berlin, it's going to be split into the French, British, American and Soviet sectors. And um, out of this uh out of this this splitting of Germany, the Western allies, which include countries like US, Britain and France, and the Soviet Union, they, dis they disagreed on how Germany should be controlled. What was the essence or what was the summary of the disagreements? For the Soviets, you've got to think from the mindset of the Soviets. They had been invaded by Germany twice in the past, in the 20th century. The first was in World War I, and the second, once again, in Operation Barbarossa, which you remember that from Chapter 4, um, of World War II. So the Soviet Union had been invaded by Germany twice in its history, and he was terribly afraid that this German um, German country, once it regains its strength, is going to pose another threat to the Soviets. And therefore, what their main focus is with regard to Germany was to keep Germany weak. And how do I keep them weak? I want to extract huge amount of reparations from the Soviet zones, take away all their money and resources. This does two things. One is to punish the Germans, and the second thing is to help the Soviets to recover. And ultimately, their aim is to turn Germany into a communist state. Now, what makes them so confident that they can do this? They believe that the Soviet Union deserved a bigger role in Germany because the Soviets actually suffered the greatest number of casualties from the German attack, unlike the Western allies who only belatedly joined the, the fight against Germany after the opening of the Second Front. So in Stalin's mind, the Soviets deserved to take more from Germany and therefore he resented, he was unhappy with the fact that the Western allies controlled the majority of Germany. Now, what do the Western allies think? In their opinion, Germany's economic recovery was important so as to prevent poverty and communism. We've talked about this before in the past, and their main goal for Germany is to become pro-democratic and pro-Western. Pro-democratic and pro-Western means that they will eventually become a democratic country and they will be um, having support of the Western allies. Okay, so at this point in the video, the teacher can pause the video. What I would like you to do is to click on this YouTube link called the Berlin Crisis 1948. This video is going to go in depth into the crisis to explain what exactly happened. And this video is a very, very effectively crafted video. Um, you can follow along in your notes. So in your notes on the page two and three, there's an overview of the main events of the Berlin blockade. This video should give a rough summary, but page, pages two and three should give you some notes that you can take with um, beyond this lesson to prep for your O-levels. Okay, so the teacher can pause the video at this point in time to just show this video. I assume at this point that the, that the class has already watched the video, so let me move on. Okay. So just a quick um, overview of what you would have seen in the video. You would have seen how um, the Soviets, or this bear, so the Soviets are generally represented by, by aggressive grizzly bears, they are encircling Berlin. 
you will notice that the flags of Britain, of America and France are being slowly encroached over by Berlin. Because Berlin, remember, it's right smack in the middle of the Soviet occupied zone. And Stalin's going to close up or he's going to have a blockade to block off any supplies from coming in. In response, the Allies are going to think, okay, you know what, how are we going to um, help Berlin? We're going to um, send in supplies via the air. So that's represented by this picture. Okay, so they're going to be sending in resources like coal, like food, like candy even. And the idea here is this. If I can continuously supply um, resources through to Berlin, then um, the people in Berlin, in the, the Allied-occupied zones, they will continue to survive. And more than that, it was a test of Stalin's resilience. If Stalin was going to shoot any of these planes, represented by birds here, shoot them down, it would be considered an act of war. And that would be sufficient for the Allies to come in and to um, wage war against the Soviets. So it was a test. Is What is Stalin going to do about this? Well, obviously, Stalin, you can see this picture over here, no-go Joe. Joe here refers to Joseph Stalin. He's doing his his best to try and prevent the planes from coming in, but obviously it's failing. Because just because you block off the land access doesn't mean you do anything to the aerial access. <clears throat> now, what was the impact of the Berlin blockade on the Cold War? Okay, we saw that on the Western side, it boosted the credibility of the Western powers because of two things. First thing is that the technological edge was displayed for the world to see. They could see that when the Western allies teamed up together, they possessed the military and economic capability of launching such a large-scale um, operation to supply things to the, to the, to the Germans if needed. Okay. Um, the second thing is that it boosted their credibility. It showed that they were willing to stand up to a dictator when it came to, time, came to, came to it. Unlike what they saw in, earlier in the World War, when, for example, people like Neville Chamberlain would choose to appease Hitler, which is to let him do what he wants. Over here in the Berlin blockade, it's very clear they're confronting Stalin and not allowing him to get what he wants. And on the Soviet Union side, how did this Berlin blockade impact them? Frankly, it humiliated them who, uh, because Stalin now had to withdraw, he had to lift the blockade, and he had to enter into negotiations with the Western powers. And from the standpoint of the world, it looked like he was the aggressor. Remember, when it comes to studying the Cold War, it's about differences in perceptions. Okay? The Western allies will perceive the Soviets as being aggressive, and the Soviets will perceive the Western allies as doing things which would threaten the Soviet Union's security. But over here, it seemed quite clear that Stalin was the one who was being aggressive and trying to cut off the um, access to Berlin. Okay. And how did this impact the wider Cold War? Um, what eventually will happen is that Germany is going to become formally divided between the Cold War superpowers and it became a visible symbol of the Cold War bipolarity. You see in the picture over here, this is a picture of what we call the Berlin Wall. Essentially, Germany is going to be split into two. The parts which were formerly held by um, Britain, America and France would combine together into Trizonia and eventually this block called Trizonia is going to become what we will know as West Germany. The Soviet occupied bloc is going to be known as the East Germany. And so Germany itself is going to be split right down in two with the Western half being taken by the Allies being a symbol of democ democracy and the Eastern German side is going to be a symbol of communism. And it's visibly being separated by this um, huge Berlin Wall which won't come down until the 1991. Hey, sorry for another day. Okay. Now, so that was about the Berlin blockade. Now we're going to shift over to talking about the formation of opposing military blocs. So on your notes, we are on page 3. The Recall that earlier on, there were opposing economic and political blocs. So that was the Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, versus Comic-Con and Cominform. Um, so where they competed um, economically, um, now they're going to be competing militarily. So you see the picture over here. Um, the one in blue, this symbol represents NATO. Um, which was occupied by the Western powers, and the uh, one in red represents the Warsaw Pact. Okay, so this is the opposing military alliance for the Soviets. And you can see the picture over here. This is a map of Europe being split right down the middle, um, with the Western side being taken by NATO, the Eastern side being taken by the Warsaw Pact. Now let's see what this means. So you know, a quick overview of what's the Warsaw Pact. Okay, so if you recall, what was the event um, that took place after the World War II? Um, Soviet Union was now was was now seen as the biggest threat to European um, security. No longer was Germany seen as the main threat because after all, Germany had been divided into four occupation zones. The Soviets, on the other hand, we look at this map on the right, we would see that as they have progressed westwards during the war, 
their the Soviet Red Army had taken over all of these different countries and have begun to set up their own communist governments. Um, and the way they set up these communist governments was to eliminate or to actually execute the democratic leaders in these countries. So as the Soviets are pushing westwards, the rest of Europe is now very worried. What is the Soviet Union trying to do? And is the Soviet Union going to continue expanding beyond Germany to take over the, um, the rest of Western Europe? And so there were huge concerns by the Western European countries alongside the USA, and they decided they needed to form a formal military alliance known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO for short. So Atlantic refers to the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic refers to the countries in the northern part of this area. Okay, so it will incorporate most of those countries, and West Germany will later be included in 1955. The moment they included West Germany inside um, the NATO pact, it caused the Soviet Union to form its own military alliances with the Eastern European satellite states, and this will become known as the Warsaw Pact. Okay. So let's first look at NATO. So this is a picture of the NATO symbol, and these are the various countries that uh, comprise NATO. You will notice that most of them are the European countries. For example, like uh, this is Germany, this is France. Okay, but there are some countries which are outside of um, Europe per se. So, for example, Canada or America. Okay, so NATO was initiated by the USA because he didn't want Western European countries to deal with security concerns by negotiating independently with the USSR. The idea here is this: if the individual countries were to negotiate with the Soviet unions, the Soviet unions might be able to use its overwhelming power to bully individual countries. Instead of that, what they'll do is to team up. The rest of Western Europe will join one team um, centered around American-European alliance that will strengthen its security because it's easier to, it's harder for the Soviets to bully or to overwhelm individual countries, sorry, a collective um, group rather than individual countries. And the principle behind NATO is that of collective security. This should sound like a very familiar principle. We've seen this in um, the League of Nations, in which an attack against any one country would warrant or would require the rest of the countries to come to the aid or support of that, that attacked country. Okay? So that was the principle of collective security in the formation of NATO. On the other side of the equation, we have the Warsaw Pact. Here are the countries that were part of the Warsaw Pact. So from the, U from the Soviet Union perspective, NATO was seen as an immediate threat to its own security. And this was triggered by the inclusion of West Germany to NATO. So, um, the Soviet Union, by Stalin, formed the Warsaw Pact. And here, similarly, members promised to defend its members in the event of invasion. However, we should be skeptical about this. And we should recall that whenever the Soviet Union initiate any kind of alliance or organization, the main beneficiary or the main person benefiting from this is not the individual countries. Rather, it's usually the Soviets themselves. So the primary concern of the Warsaw Pact is less about these individual countries being invaded by the Western European powers, but it's number one about preventing these countries from joining NATO or joining the Western allies, and it's about preventing the Soviet Union from being invaded by the West. Okay. So what is the significance of these military alliances? On paper, NATO and Warsaw Pact never waged war against each other. So on that front, when you think, hmm, maybe these military alliances contributed to peace, Possibly. Okay. But we recall, this is part of the wider theme of the Cold War, where countries will compete each other, compete against each other, not using military fighting, but against ideas. Okay. And how does this lead to conflict? These alliances sought to increase their own influence internationally and minimize each other's influence within and outside of Europe. Essentially, they're competing for allies. And this contributed to an increasingly bipolar world. Now we're on to the final section. See, thus far, we've talked about the opposing economic and political alliances in Europe. Then we talked about the Berlin crisis, which centers around Germany, still in Europe. And thirdly, we've talked about the military alliances, NATO versus Warsaw Pact, also in Europe. However, very soon, the Cold War is going to expand beyond Europe to engulf the rest of the world as well. So the tensions which center on Europe is going to extend to other areas in the world because countries are going to become increasingly pressured to support either the US side or the Soviet side or to declare that they are non-aligned, meaning I don't want to be part of either bloc. Accordingly, if you have chosen not to be part of either bloc, you would be um, subjected to um, influence, for example, you'll be pressured. Okay, I may not be able to get the same kind of advantages that I would have if I was part of the US bloc or I wouldn't have the advantages of being part of the Soviet bloc. 
So either way, countries were being pressured by the Cold War to start to pick the sides. And so the international impact. So the Cold War conflict began to spread and there were three main events that uh, took place. The first is the Korean War in 1950 to 1953. This is the topic of the next um, chapter that we'll be studying in chapter 9, um, a conflict between the North and South Korean, um, part, the parts of Korea. The North is being led by Kim Il-sung. Some of you might, might know him, Kim Il-sung, um, who is being supported by the communists um, and the Soviets. And the Southern side is being supported, is being led by Sing Man Rhee, a supposedly democratic person and who is being supported by America. Okay? So that will be chapter 9. At the same time, a Viet there was a war that started in Vietnam. Okay, This war, you will notice, stretches for close to 20 years. And similar to the Korean War, it is because Vietnam got separated into two. The northern half is going to be led by um, the communists, and the southern half is going to be led by the democrats. And this um, is a part of this year's syllabus, so just keep this in mind. The next chapter that we'll be studying is chapter 10. This is on the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which the Soviet leader, um, Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev is going to replace Stalin. He's going to be planting or he's going to be sending nuclear weapons over to Cuba, which is just south of America, in an attempt to threaten the Americans. And this was the closest the world ever got to nuclear war. So these two topics, the Korean War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, these are the new topics that we'll be studying. And um, both chapter 9 and chapter 10, these are your source-based case study chapters. Meaning, in your actual examinations for O or N levels, these are the two chapters that will come up that may come out for your source-based case studies. Okay, yeah, that's all for today's lesson. Thank you.